morning and welcome to Covenant Presbyterian Church. We're so glad that you're here. I have a few announcements uh, as we get started. Uh, first off, if you haven't grabbed a order of worship, they are out in the, uh, in the entryway there. You're welcome to grab one. And if you don't have one, one of the ushers would love to bring you one. Uh, also, you'll notice out there, you will see there is this uh, advertisement for the Covenant Corners, Four Corners. Uh, and that is for, for women, so I, I won't be attending, but I would encourage you to. It's a wonderful opportunity in which you can go uh, in the first one, or Enika Eddie's uh, house, she's opening up, and they're going to have a game night. And so you're welcome to attend there, and there's more information you can gather there. Um, and so I would encourage you, uh, particularly if you're a woman, to, in, in, uh, to investigate that more. Uh, as well, we are in the middle of a mission-focused month, and you'll see that there are... Uh, these little bulletin inserts. We've been doing those. These are kind of like uh, baseball cards, probably more valuable. Um, but you can put these in your in your Bible. Uh, and so as you're you're thumbing through through the week and, and such, you can be uh, you can be kept up to date on on the missionaries. Uh, we'll we'll try and update these as we go on, on certain things. But there's prayer requests. And so uh, today we have Dan Sear uh, and his wife are here. And so you can see uh, kind of uh, what's going on in his life. Prayer requests. Uh, and then on the back, there are some other ones as well. And so we'll continue to do that throughout the rest of the month. Um, but those are, are tremendous uh, opportunities for you to be aware of, of how um, missions is going about overseas and uh, in the surrounding community here at Covenant. Uh, so with that, I would ask you if you will stand. And as you're standing, let us be reminded that today is, is the day in which Christ has risen. Our call to worship comes from Psalm 100. It says, Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into His presence with singing. Know that the Lord, He is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him. Bless His name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. You'll pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have blessed us with the opportunity to come and worship you. Lord, we're thankful for your Son and how he's interceding for us now on the throne by your, by your side. Lord, we're thankful for how you have sent him, but you have also sent your Holy Spirit. And so we pray that you would send your Spirit to anoint us this morning. We pray that you would remove distractions from our hearts and from our minds, that you would tune our hearts to you that you would, um, you would allow our, our minds to be sharp upon you. We pray that everything that we do, everything that we think, and everything that we say would be done to your glory. And Lord, we, we pray as you have taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, He rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And six on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And against you shall John judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. reading is found on page two of your order of worship. As you read there, we're going to be talking about the God, about God's providence. Uh, oftentimes we get a little confused between what it means that God is sovereign and his works of providence. Sovereignty, God being sovereign is one of his attributes. God's providence is, is how he acts out to that sovereign reign as he's, as he's ruling and reigning on high. And so as I ask the question, if you'll respond responsively. What are God's works of providence? God's works of providence are His most holy, wise, and powerful, preserving, governing all His creatures, ordering them and all their actions to His own glory. What is God's providence towards the angels? God's by His providence permitted some of His angels willfully and inadvertently to fall into sin and damnation, limiting or wording death and all their sins to his own glory, and establish the rest in holiness and happiness, employing them all at his pleasure. 
pleasure in the administration of his power, mercy, and justice. What was the providence of God towards man in the estate in which he was created? Providence of God towards man in the estate in which he was created was the placing him in paradise, appointing him addressed it, giving him liberty to eat of the fruit of the earth, putting the creatures under his dominion, or ordaining marriage for his health, affording him communion with himself, instituting the Sabbath, entering into a covenant life with him, upon condition of his personal perfect and perpetual obedience, of which the tree of life was a pledge, and forbidding to eat the tree of knowledge of the good and evil, upon the pain of death. You may be seated. If you'll pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, we are thankful to know that you don't just have the ability, that it is not just your in your nature that you can rule and reign over all, but that you do, that you put your hand out and that you act and that you rule not just in our lives, but in this whole world, in this whole universe, or that you are holding it together and that you are doing amazing things for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, we're thankful that you are a good father, and one that is bounding in steadfast love towards us. So as your children, we come and we offer up prayers to you, knowing that you hear them, knowing that you are wanting to hear them from us as your children. So, Lord, we pray that you would be with your word as it goes forth throughout this world this morning on your day. Lord, we pray that you would be with the church, that you would continue to sustain her, that you would continue to grow her, that you would be with those that are serving in faraway lands that may be more difficult than here in the United States. We pray that you would give them protection. We pray for the persecuted church, that you would be protecting those individuals that are, that are struggling to, to continue on. We pray that you would give them health, that you would give them food and endurance. But Lord, we pray that you would continue to grow their faith. Lord, we pray for the United States. Lord, we're thankful for so many that have gone before us that have worked hard to give a nation that is one in which these freedoms are here for us. Lord, we pray that you would be with those in the military that are serving overseas and here. Lord, we pray that you would give them protection, that you would continue to be with them. Pray that you would be with the chaplains that are serving in the armed forces. And Lord, we pray that you would bring peace to this world. Lord, not just a peace without, without wars, but a true peace with you. Lord, we pray as we're thinking of that and how you have blessed us with this church, this local church of covenant. We're thankful for the ways in which you have continued to bring forth individuals, Lord, the ways in which they have been able to serve and the different ministries that come about because of it. Lord, we're thankful for the ways in which you have allowed the women to gather and to, to come up with a way in which individuals can get together and they can fellowship with another, they can get to know each other more, be in each other's homes. We pray that you would be with this Four Corners ministry. We pray that those that would be able to attend would enjoy it. Lord, those that maybe can't make this time would look forward to the next opportunity that will be coming around the corner. Lord, we pray as well that you would continue to be with uh, the, the session in the diaconate. Lord, we thank you for the gift that it was for them to be able to meet this past week and the work that was done. We pray that you would continue to bless their labors and those that are supporting them in it. Lord, we also thank you for the way in which you have allowed Pastor Jamie to be uh, in, admitted into the DMIN program. Lord, we pray that you would be with him as he starts his studies and as he prepares and works to, to balance life and, and work and ministry here. We pray that you would continue to grow him and mature him in it. Uh, Lord, we pray as well for the individuals here at Covenant. We think of Thomas and Lorelai. We pray that you would continue to be with them, Lord, as they are, they are struggling, Lord, as they are looking to you and as they are finding uh, continual encouragement from you. Lord, we pray that you would be with them and their extended family. We pray that you would give doctors wisdom. We pray that you would give them encouragement. Lord, we pray that your will would be done and that you would be glorified in all of it. Lord, we pray also for Laura Hutchinson and upcoming tests that she has. We thank you that they're able to happen and some relief that she's been able to experience. We pray that you would continue to minister to her as well and her family as they, as they help her. 
Lord, we think of the many expectant mothers uh, through natural childbirth, but also through adoption. We pray that you would continue to be with these children. Lord, I pray that they would never know a day without you. We pray as well for the marriages that are represented here, Lord, the ones that are are reminded over and over again of how you have laid down your life for the church. And so, Lord, we pray that men would lead their families well, that they would be encouraged. We pray for uh, continued growth towards you and the means of grace. Lord, we also ask that you would be with those um, that have loved ones that are not walking with you, those that maybe have tasted and seen the goodness of your gospel, but are for some reason walking away, we pray that you would draw them back, that you would bring conviction, that you would allow those seeds that have been planted and watered to grow fruit and to go forth. And Lord, we pray that you would be with us as we continue to see those that are facing different health concerns, whether it's uh, spring allergies that are coming a little early or whether it's uh, some uh, virus or bug that's coming around. We pray that you would give health, that you give endurance, uh, and that you would give encouragement as a body. We may be able to lift each other up. Lord, we also pray that you would be with Dan Steer as he comes to, to bring your word. We pray that you would give him great clarity, that you would allow our ears to be attuned to you and to the words that are coming out of his mouth, that they would be your words and not his words. We pray that you would be glorified and that we would see you more clearly through it. Lord, we also thank you for the opportunity that we have to give to you. And so, Lord, we ask that you would answer these things in your son's name. Amen. Our morning offering, let's be reminded by Luke chapter 2, verse 38. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For with the measure that you use it, it will be measured back to you.
thank you for your generosity. We thank you for, for the ways in which you have contributed to bless us, the ways in which you've provided for us. We thank you for the ways in which you have allowed us to respond with generosity as well. Lord, we pray that you would use these monies, this offering, this tithe that you have allowed us to give to your glory and for uh, the, the kingdom, your kingdom. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. <laughs> Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter 1. And I will read the entire short <coughs> chapter. <laughs> Hear the word of the Lord. 
Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you all in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers beloved by God, that he has chosen you because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Please pray with me. Father, as we come before the word this morning, we pray that you would open our hearts, that you would open our minds, And that your word would find its place and do its work in each of us. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Well, I am glad to be back with you all. It's been a while. Um, See some good friends. I I was going to say old friends, but I can't say that, right? Um, Good friends. Um, of long standing. How's that? <laughs> and uh, I was asked to give just a, a brief update since uh, Susan and I are one of your supportive missionaries, a brief update of where we are in the ministry before I actually begin preaching. Um, it was about a week ago, a little less than a week ago, that I got back from Ghana, West Africa. And uh, had a good time there, was uh, able to teach one conference on the Book of Romans in a new venue in Cape Coast. I had a group of people that uh, had never really heard uh, verse by verse exposition of a book of the Bible before. Uh, Ghanaian preaching tends to be grab a verse that sort of grabs you and just go wherever it leads you. Uh, There's not really much context. There's not a lot of uh, exposition that goes on at all. So it was was eye-opening for them, but it was just a joy for me. I love the book of Romans. I love to be able to teach about the gospel. We'll come back to that in just a minute, in fact. But um, it was a little bittersweet, I guess, because this probably will be my last year Uh, um, with ministry, with Equipping Leaders International. I'm planning to retire uh, at the end of this year, and so we're working to prepare, uh, in a sense, working ourselves out of a job, handing over the responsibilities for some of these things to our Ghanaian (coughs) brethren, which is really, I think, the whole idea when it comes to missions, right? You're, You're supposed to go, train people there, and then leave. I'm not Ghanaian, so I don't need to be there over the long term. It needs to be something that they are able to sustain for themselves. And so we've handed over the administration of the seminary program, the MINTS program to them, and I was able to meet and talk with them about some of the challenges that they have in front of them. Uh, They were hoping that we would provide the teachers, and I'm saying no, Um, really you need to provide your own teachers and and it needs to be a standalone self-sufficient program 
So it's been, it's been interesting. I, I plan to go back in September and we'll see how, uh, how they have progressed in all of this. And I'll stay in touch with them, of course, between now and then. But it was a good trip, even though I got sick the second week. And uh, thankfully the Lord made it so I didn't have any, any actual teaching scheduled. So I was able to stay in my room and behave myself and get over whatever it was that I had. I, I don't like being sick and especially not overseas. But that's, uh, that's just a brief overview of where we are. Um, and hopefully by the end of this year, we'll be able to step back and the Ghanaians will pick up and run with it. And uh, I may go back and check on them every now and then if God provides. Uh, it really is my second home. I will miss Ghana uh, and miss being able to be there with the brothers and sisters. So um, is, that, is that good enough, Jamie? Does that work? Okay. Um, let, let me shift. I want to tell you a story before we begin. Um, Valentine's Day, 50 years ago, yeah, 50 years ago, Susan and I were at a holiday on ice. I don't know if, do they even do that anymore? Uh, Susan has always loved ice skating, and so we were at this holiday on ice. She was having a wonderful time because she loves ice skating. I had something else in mind, all right? So here we are, we've been there, they've done all of these graceful things. We reach the point where we are at intermission. And I very strategically had seated myself on her left side. So when, as we're clapping for them at the intermission, I keep grabbing her left hand. And she's wondering, what, what are you doing? Well, I had something in mind. And so I finally got her left hand and I slid a ring on her finger. Now, we had this thing that we did. I, back in the day, there was, there was a candy, a snack called Cracker Jacks. <laughs> Cracker Jacks came in a box and there was always a little gift, a little prize in the box. You remember that, right? Oftentimes, I don't know why, providentially, she would buy me Cracker Jacks and in the box was a ring. So I would be slipping Cracker Jacks rings on her fingers all the time. She thought that what I had just put on her finger was another Cracker Jacks ring. And then she looked down. I'll grant you, I was a college student the stone, you probably had to have a magnifying glass, <laughs> but there was a stone on that ring and she looked at it and she was shocked and spontaneously, it's at intermission, spontaneously she stands up and goes like this in front of this whole crowd and people start breaking out in applause. <laughs> she said yes. Well, it was something she didn't expect. It came to her completely unexpectedly. It was something that literally changed her life and continues to change her life. <laughs> and it was something that she wasn't ashamed about. I mean, she was willing to stand up in front of thousands of people and show off what had just happened. All right? Well, that's my outline. I want to talk about the gospel, and I want to talk about the, the gospel. First of all, the gospel comes to us in a way unexpectedly. What did I do? I thought I had it on. It's on. Do I just need to turn up the volume a little bit? <laughs> I can do that. <laughs> I can do that. So here's my outline. One, the gospel comes to us unexpectedly. That's what Paul is. I'm following the text, by the way. Secondly, 
The gospel changes us. It changes our lives. And thirdly, the gospel, and here's the pun, the gospel rings out from us. That's why I used the ring as the illustration, because literally the word that's used there is the idea of a bell or a trumpet. It rings out from us. So let's just look at this and, and consider what the text has before us. First of all, I'm going to talk about the gospel comes to us. And if you, you know, if you want the theological term here, the theological term is election, because this is what Paul's talking about. We usually think that somehow we embrace Christ. And that's, that's true. But look at how Paul says this. We know, verse 4, we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. There's the election. Why? Because our gospel came to you. <laughs> it's completely the opposite of what we tend to think. We think that we came to the gospel and embraced it. But in Paul's mind, the gospel came to them. It came to them in the person of Paul. He brought it to them, and he brought it to them under the providence of God. It's interesting that we talked about God's providence this morning. The gospel, in other words, is under God's control, not under ours. It is he who sends it to the people that he has chosen. And it's really interesting when we consider how that works. And I, I want to come back to it in a minute, but press pause and let's, let's talk a minute about the gospel. Because I, I have to admit, I love the gospel. I love the Lord Jesus Christ. I hope you do too. But I want to remind you about the gospel. I want to remind you, first of all, that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Now, I know this is a Presbyterian church, but let me ask you, how many of you are sinners? Would you raise your hand? Huh? Yeah, good. It is a Presbyterian church. You guys have figured it out. He came into the world to save sinners. Like you. And like me. Let me put it this way. Your sin is what qualifies you for the gospel. Isn't that cool? We tend to think, and when I've talked to people about the gospel, the way they respond is, but I'm such a sinner. I don't. Yeah. That's what qualifies you. And it continues, by the way, to qualify you because you're still sinning. So you still need the gospel. You still continuously are being saved by the work of Christ and the intercession of Christ on your behalf right now. Huh. So when you come and you trust in Christ by faith, all of your sins, yes, past, present, and future sins, the ones you haven't even done yet, they're all forgiven. Christ took all of those sins with him to the cross and he nailed them to the cross. They're gone. I love teaching this in Ghana because the first question that comes, but, but if you tell people, I'm teaching pastors, if you tell people that their future sins are forgiven, they'll just go live like sinners. I said, well, do you want to go live in sin? Well, no. Why not? That's point two. The gospel changes you. The gospel changes you. All of your sin is forgiven. It's all gone. 
And in the great exchange, as you trust in Christ and he takes your sin on himself, then he gives you his righteousness. Perfect, passive righteousness. You didn't do anything to earn it. You never will. It's just simply given to you. And this is the great part to my mind. Your continuing sin can't affect that righteousness at all. So you are righteous, perfectly righteous in God's eyes if you are trusting in Christ. You are as righteous as Christ is. Wow. Really? Yeah. Really. Because we're told in Scripture that Christ is our righteousness and our sanctification and our redemption. 1 Corinthians 1.30. You don't have any righteousness. But as a believer in Jesus Christ, you have the very righteousness of Christ credited to your account. That's astounding. That's amazing. Because of Christ's work, then, God is on your side. God the Holy Spirit is praying for you. God the Son is interceding for you, and God the Father is for you. All of that is in Romans chapter 8. God is on your side, and nothing in the world can change that. Nothing. That's the end of Romans chapter 8. Did I tell you I love Romans? So that's the gospel. That's the good news. It's not just our sins are forgiven. It is that God is on our side and he has plans for us. Plans that don't stop here. In fact, this is just the beginning. The plans that God has for us carry forward through all of eternity. We get to spend eternity with Jesus. Doing good work serving him, loving him with perfect, sinless hearts. <laughs> wow. That's beautiful. Now, Paul says this gospel, this gospel came to you, but it didn't just come to you in words. Now, what you've been hearing are words. But God willing, there was something else going on, too, because... What Paul says is he says, I want you to see what goes on behind the scenes in the preaching of the gospel. Our gospel didn't just come to you in word, but also in power, in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. This is what happens when somebody gets up in front of you, like me, and makes a fool out of themselves preaching the gospel. Because that's what we do. We're fools for Christ, all right? But behind the scenes, what's taking place is that God the Holy Spirit is working in power to do the work that only he can do and taking that truth and providing full conviction, if you will, sort of mixing together the word that is being preached, the character of the preacher, because that's there too, the power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, and the full conviction, and all of that is worked together, and when it comes together, someone comes to faith. And that's what happens, happened to the Thessalonians. They came to faith in Jesus Christ. So this is, by the way, this is not deep theology. Paul, this is one of Paul's earlier letters. And if you go back to the book of Acts, you're going to discover that he was in Thessalonica maybe a month or so. He wasn't there very long. He got chased out. They chased him out to Berea. But people came to faith. And so Paul tells them, this is what happened when you came to faith in Jesus Christ. It was the power of God. So, the gospel comes to us. 
Now, here's the thing. We, we have a tendency, we look at the outward. As Presbyterians, we're, we're, we're sort of connoisseurs of preaching, right? I mean, <laughs> admit it. You're sitting there judging me right now. <laughs> right? Right? I mean, you're sort of going, well, I, you know, he... He doesn't stay in the pulpit. No, I don't. Get over it. <laughs> but we do that. You know, we're, we're focused on the outward appearance. In Ghana, for example, preaching in Ghana, <laughs> nobody stays still in Ghana, number one. And you've got to have a, you've got to have a sweat rag because if you're not sweating, you ain't preaching. <laughs> all right, so you're, you're going like this all the time, all right? Well, it's that, and, and in our background, you talk about somebody like Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards, do you know this? His sermons were like two hours long. And you know what he did? He stood behind the pulpit and he read his manuscript. Hardly even looked up. Read it in a monotone. God still used it. God still used him. You see, it's not the preacher. It's not the words. That's what we see. That's what we hear. But behind it is the power of God and the working of the Holy Spirit. It's all part of this walking by faith thing. God loves to use inadequate means to do his work. And I'm inadequate. Everybody who stands in this pulpit is inadequate. But God loves to use those means. Now let me, let me move on to point two. How do we know it comes to us? How do we know, how do you know the gospel came to you? Well, Paul's second point is here in verse uh, six. Verse six, he says, you became imitators of us. See, the gospel changes us. These people in Thessalonica, they heard the gospel and they began imitating Paul and the Lord. They began living their lives in a different way. He talks about it at the end of the chapter. It says he turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. There was a change in their life that was obvious even though Paul was only there for a short period of time. Because it's not Paul. It's the gospel. It's the power of God that changes our lives. Let me tell you a story about a guy named Mafud. Mafud was the country coordinator for Agape Puppets. I don't, do you know Agape Puppets? You know about it? It's one of the most fabulous evangelistic ministries I know of. They go around the world and use puppets to share the gospel with kids while adults are listening. And literally thousands of people come to faith. So he was their coordinator for Lebanon. Mafud had come to faith and uh, in this context he was working with some Syrian refugees. And it was a hot day and uh, they were doing hot work, and so they all took their shirts off. And the Syrian refugees stopped and stared at Mafud because his, his upper body was covered with scars. And he saw them looking, and he said, what would you do to somebody who did this to you? Well, they told him in no uncertain terms what they would do to somebody who scarred them. You see, he'd been in the Syrian conflict with Lebanon. He'd been captured, he'd been injured, he'd been tortured. And so he looked at these Syrians that he was working with and he said, you did this to me. And now I serve you. And it was stunning to them. 
they, they had no, no way to be able to understand that. And it led to many of them coming to faith in Jesus Christ. Be why? Because Mafud was an imitator of Christ. That's, that's what Christ says. You did this to me, and now I serve you. Well, that's what the gospel does in our lives. It causes us to become not just imitators with the joy of the Holy Spirit, but it causes us also to become examples to those around us. People are able, they should be able to look at us and see a difference. That there is something in us that the gospel has done that has changed us from the way we used to be. That's going to be different for all of us. But the change is there because the gospel changes us. And how could it not? When we stop and think about the gospel, it is just breathtaking. All of our sins, all of them. You know that argument you had on the way here? Somehow that happens on Sunday mornings all the time. All that sin that's in your life, and you're well aware of it, even though you hide it from everybody else, but that's all forgiven. Christ has paid the penalty for that. And you are not condemned. And God has a plan for your life. You're welcome to come into his presence anytime and talk to him. Ask for his help. It's stunning. So, how do we know it's changing us? Well, here's my third point. The third point is that it rings out from us. It rings out from us. It, it just, like with Susan, you're not ashamed of it. It's something that you are so stunned that it actually happened, that you're willing to talk to people. Now, I know that this is really strange, and I, be patient with me, but I have to tell you that I am severely introverted. I don't know if you could actually even believe that, but it's true, that I don't, I don't naturally talk to people. If I'm not in the pulpit or if I'm not teaching, I'm usually sitting in the back because I, I just don't like attention. Again, one of those illustrations of God using inadequate means. I am the last guy who should have been called to be a preacher and a missionary. God has a sense of humor. Not all of us are going to be buttonholing everybody we meet about the gospel. But we're also not going to be ashamed of it. When people say, well, are you a Christian? Absolutely. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you what he did for me. I mean, that's all it is. Let me tell you what Jesus did for me. You don't have to have a theological degree. You don't have to have some kind of doctorate in evangelism to just say, here's what Jesus did in my life. I was this way, and Jesus came into my life. The gospel came to me, and I'm not that way anymore. God has changed me. So... My time is almost gone. What I want to say to you is this. Gospel comes to you, election. Gospel changes you, right? Imitation. Gospel rings out from you, proclamation. And this is missions. That's what missions is. Missions is here in Fayetteville, in Ghana, wherever God sends you, just simply sharing what Jesus has done. Sharing his word. 
Missions, <laughs> I had this wrong for a long time. Missions is not about guilt. Missions is not about panic, like if we don't get to work, then people are not going to get saved. All right. Missions isn't even about duty. This is what you've been called to do. You're going to have to do it. Missions is just the natural outgrowth of the fact that we're stunned at what Christ has done for us. The beauty, the simplicity, the fullness of the gospel. All my sins are forgiven. I'm righteous in the eyes of God. I've been restored to fellowship with him and given not just a future here, but a future forever in his presence. And when the gospel grabs hold of us, when the beauty of what God has done for us in Christ grabs hold of us, we are compelled in terms of missions. It just rings out from us. It's almost like you can't keep quiet about it. So, so what? <laughs> it's a nice outline. You got it, right? Three points. You got the outline. So here's the question. I, I always try to end a sermon this way. So what does that mean for you? So what? Well, number one, I think what it means is this. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Preach it to yourself every day because you forget. It's why we get together on Sundays and why we hear the word. It's because we forget. But you forget by the time you get to Monday morning. So get up tomorrow morning and preach the gospel to yourself. Remind yourself who you are in Christ, what Jesus has done for you. Maybe spend some time in prayer thanking him for it. You see, for years, I had this idea that, yes, Jesus has saved me. I've gotten all my sins forgiven. But what I need to do is I sort of need to keep God happy by doing the right stuff. You understand that? It's, it's performance-oriented, Christianity. My sins are forgiven. That's, ta that's taken care of. But if I don't behave myself, God's not going to be too happy with me. It's not true. It's not true. God delights in you. He loves you. He looks at you. I know, I know, you're a sinner. You all admitted it, right? He looks at you in your sin and he smiles. Not because of your sin, but because he knows where he's taking you. He doesn't just see you today. He sees you as you will be. And you're going to be like Christ. And so the Father loves you just like he loves his Son. And he smiles. Preach the gospel to yourself every day. Now, the question then becomes, as a church, as a body of people, is the gospel ringing out from us? Are we proclaiming the gospel? I don't really have to ask that here. I think it, it's pretty clear that that's happening. But it's a point that I think we need to just continue to evaluate. Where would the Lord have me to ring out the gospel? How am I being called? I'm right at this point where I'm looking at retirement. Does that mean I stop ringing out the gospel? It just means maybe it shifts a bit. And I do it someplace else than Ghana. But that's what we need to do. And we need to recognize that the gospel came to us because God had a plan. 
He had a plan for you, every one of you. And the gospel changes you and continues to change you. And as it changes you, it rings out from you for the glory of God in the midst of all that is going on in your life. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord encourage you. Pray with me, please. Father, we thank you so much for your kindness to us. We thank you that you have blessed us. We thank you that you look upon us with favor in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that you would teach us daily to remind ourselves, to preach to ourselves about the gospel, and that you would use us for your glory as those who ring out the gospel wherever we find ourselves. We ask it in your name and for your glory. Amen. countenance upon you and give you his peace and all God's people said